Good morning. I'm actually uh, recording this the night before, uh, but I know many of you are watching it in the morning. I hope that you are all doing well. I miss that we are physically not together, but we are together in this with God no matter what. And through periods like this, we're going to trust in God more. We're going to love each other more, and we're going to evangelize more. This is only going to make us stronger. You know, I spoke to our brothers and sisters uh, from the Stratford Church of Christ in London last night. We sang together. We prayed together. I was encouraged by this, man. And they send all their love and encouragement to you all because, again, we're in this together with God. During the French War, a train carrying a passenger was, or excuse me, a train carrying passengers was compelled to go over 60 miles, a very rough road, and reach its destination within an hour. Now, the engineer was the bearer to make sure these passengers got to their destination safely, and his wife and child were in the coach. Now, every moment on the rough trip threatened to toss the train over the embankment or over a bridge. And as it rolled from side to side, leaping at times almost in the air, rushing past stations, the few people inside, they held their breath, and they often cried out with terror as they sped along. But there was one who was on that train who knew nothing of this kind of fear, and that was the child of the engineer. Happy as a bird, she laughed aloud. And then when she was asked if she were not, why she wasn't afraid, she looked up and answered, why? My father is the engineer. A little later, uh, the engineer came into the car to cheer up with his wife, or to cheer up his wife, and he wiped the drops of sweat from his face, and his daughter leapt into his arms, and she laid her head upon his chest, happy and peaceful, as when at home. Now, the train made it safely to its destination. The little girl, she knew it all along. Life feels a lot like we're riding that train, doesn't it? Several months ago, many of us didn't even imagine we'd ever see the circumstances that we as a nation and the entire world are facing right now. Maybe you're living in uncertainty. Maybe there were already things that were taking place in your life before the current fear of our society. Maybe there are things that have mounted up since that are causing you to doubt, to be afraid. It's hard to be like that little girl in the midst of a ride that feels chaotic. And yet, if that little girl can trust her earthly father, who though he did guide everyone to safety, didn't know what the outcome would be, how much more should we trust in God, who's going to guide us, who's going to guide the faithful to safety and knows the final outcome? So what then should our response in trial be? If you have your Bibles, I want us to go ahead and read together from Psalm 31. A psalm of David, a man who understood dark times and someone who we can learn from and how we can respond in the midst of trials. First, we must have absolute trust in his security. Let's go ahead and look at Psalm 31, verse 1 through 3. David says, In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. See, the idea of refuge is the word that the Hebrews would use to describe the shade from a strong, large tree. In a desert region like where David lived, a traveler's number one enemy was the beating down of that desert sun and the lack of water. So if you found a lush, thick tree in the midst of the desert, it meant not only was there relief from the sun and the shade, but fresh water was nearby. Now to the weary, exhausted, anxiety-filled traveler, that tree provided hope. So David is saying, my safety, my source of life, my relief is all in God. My trust is completely in you. Like he would say in Psalm 16 and verse 1, preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. When David says, let me never be put to shame, he's saying, let me never fall flat in my face because I didn't trust you or put my trust or I put my trust in something else. You see, I want us to go ahead. Let's go ahead and go back to Psalm 31. Let's keep reading and keep reading with verse 2. And David would say, incline your ears to me, rescue me speedily, be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. David begs for God's attentive hearing. It's like a, it's like a child tugging a parent's hem or arm to get their attention. He trusts that God can act quickly, and David, in the midst of his surrounding trials, desires for God to act quickly. He calls God to be what he knows God is, a rock of refuge. He's no longer just a tree that provides shade, but now we get this picture of a stronger image, a rock that provides safety. Rocks were often strong and movable places in the land of Judea that acted like natural protection from an enemy or a predator site or even harsh weather. Many cities were built on large plateaus or mountains like the city of Jerusalem or Edom because it was extremely difficult for enemies to climb up the rugged mountains to conquer it. 
Then he calls God his strong fortress. As he increases the imagery of God's strength, he's saying, you're not just like a tree, God, that provides shade. You're not just like an immovable rock, but you are an impenetrable fortress with the intent to protect and shield us. Why is David talking like this? See, David was in the midst of a chaotic period of his life, as he was in many times of his life. Many of these things were absolutely out of his control. He literally was in danger of his life and in the waiting game, wondering when his enemies would strike. Many times being backed into a corner, not knowing what to do, but to ride it out for as long as he possibly could. He knew that if he didn't put his trust in God, his spiritual life was in danger. And to him, it was much more important to trust in God than in his weapons or soldiers or physical fortress. He recognized that if his soul wasn't secure, then did it all really matter? He knew that God above was his true protection. You know, Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 3 would say, the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Moses in Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6 wrote in his final words to Israel before they entered the land of Canaan, he would tell them, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of your enemies, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. God himself said in Isaiah 41 verse 10, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. There's a lot of things going on in this world that makes us feel like we're vulnerable, right? And there is no security. Many people overstocked on items these previous weeks because of a desire for security. Uh, many people may have been impulsively internet searching for news articles and statistics to alleviate their feeling of a lack of security. Many people are home right now to feel that sense of security. But at the end of the day, those things may offer some relief and maybe some form of security in things that are temporary, but God guarantees you something far better. Now, we should take precautions in what we're called to do, and many of us are doing that. But don't have a mountain of toilet paper in your house or a statistical chart memorized of the things that are going on right now and neglect the one thing you, without a shadow of a doubt, can be secured in. That your life is hidden with Christ and you have been given eternal protection as an adopted child and heir of God. And all of this, you know who can hold their heads up high? It's God's people. It's those who follow Jesus. If you're watching this, I hope you are confident in your, God, in your security. Or I hope you're confident in your God's safety and security. If not, pray to him for that confidence. Read the word. Restore your trust in him. Because when there is absolute trust in his security, we can overcome these trials. We just have to trust in God the way David did. Appeal to his glory, knowing that he will lead us and guide us to true safety. Secondly, we must have absolute trust in his deliverance. Let's go ahead and look at verse 4 through 5 of Psalm 31. And it reads, You take me out of the net they have hidden from me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Uh, when David says, you take me out of the net they have hidden from me, he's describing a military weapon that was used to capture enemies or even trap enemies to kill them while they struggled to free themselves from the net. Uh, he's praising God from delivering his, or excuse me, he's praising God for delivering him from his enemies and the cunning nature of those who wish him harm. David, when he says, into your hands I commit my spirit, what he's saying is, God, I trust you so much that in the face of troubles, in the face of sickness, in social alienation, I give you all of me. This gives us insight really into how bad David's situation was. Only God can change the outcome, and David knew that. So David gave up control of the situation and allowed God's will to rule, and he surrendered himself over to God. David rested on God's faithfulness to his promises to his people, trusting that God had something amazing in store for him, no matter the external circumstances. Notice the psalm doesn't say that all of David's external trouble completely disappears, and yet he still regards God as having redeemed him even in that moment. Is it possible to be delivered by God, even if all the things surrounding us that troubles us aren't completely gone or have completely ended? Absolutely. David believed that. Peace, even in the midst of chaos. Shelter in the time of storm. Protection, even in the midst of danger. Deliverance, even in the midst of hopelessness. David, in the middle of his troubles, felt God reaching out to him and pulling him out, lifting his spirit and giving him strength. You know, Peter would write in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, he says, Then the Lord knows how to rescue 
the godly from trials. Paul, the apostle, confidently, even in prison, knowing his physical fate was near, said in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 18, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so we have a cunning enemy that wishes only our destruction, and that enemy is Satan. And you know what? One of the best tools he has in his arsenal that could cause us to falter in these times of trial? Fear. He used it in time and time and time again against God's people. Fear spread like wildfire amongst the camp of Israel in the wilderness. Fear is what caused many of the Christians in the first century to leave Christianity, according to the Hebrews writer. But fear, unhealthy anxiety that causes us to doubt God's deliverance, doesn't come from God. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. See, God's deliverance doesn't always match our expectations, but it's always the best. Sometimes he removes us from a difficult situation so we don't have to face it anymore. Other times his deliverance comes in the form of strength to help us and sustain us through the hardships we're facing. See, the circumstances may not change, but we're enabled, we're strengthened by him to overcome it. But ultimately, God has offered true deliverance, eternal deliverance through the blood of his son, which is the best deliverance we can possibly receive. Third, and finally, as we look at Psalm 31, we must have absolute praise for his security and deliverance. Let's go ahead and read Psalm 31, verse 6 through 8. Psalm 31, verse 6 through 8, and David says, I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction. You know the distress of my soul and you have delivered me, or excuse me, you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. David uses a strong term to describe how he felt about putting trust in idols. He is loyal to God and he hates idolatry. The term he uses to describe these idols, he says they're worthless or false. See, those who put their trust in idols, like Jonah describes in Jonah chapter 2 and verse 8, forsake their hope of steadfast love. They disregard the true deliverance and security of the one true God. Idols, they can't offer anything true like God because they themselves are made from created things. They're physical. They can, they can be destroyed. They're shaped. They can decay. The statues that were worshipped by pagans, they couldn't feel or, or love or empathize. They're worthless. David is showing his true trust in God, not in physical things, but in he who is eternal. And because this, he offers up praise and worship. He says, I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction. While others worship idols, David finds complete contentment and satisfaction in God's faithful love. Notice the assurance in his tone. He says, you've seen my affliction. You know the distress of my soul. You have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place or a secure wide place. This is a song of praise to God's power and deliverance and protection. You remember like Paul and Silas, right? In the midst of their hardships, chained in prison, feet in stocks, they're tortured. They didn't reject God and say, well, you know, maybe these pagans are happy or worshiping their false idols. No. Luke tells us in Acts chapter 16 and verse 25, they were praying and singing hymns to God. Paul told the Colossians in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. James, the brother and disciple of Jesus, wrote the afflicted, or wrote to the afflicted Christians, rather. He said, count it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. In the midst of all these hardships, we can still find joy. You may be saying to yourself, Paul, a lot of our plans have been derailed because of this COVID-19 thing. A lot of our aspirations, our goals, the things in which we thought would happen. How can we be joyful? How can we praise? People all around the world are scared. The economy is probably going to suffer because of all this. How can we praise God in a time like this? See, more than ever, do we need to be praising God in this time? Those plans, those goals, those aspirations in the world, the stock market, they're not bad things, but you and I were never promised those things would go as planned. And if all your trust has been in those things, it's no different than idolatry. And they produce nothing. In the grand scheme of things, they produce nothing. 
What we are promised is that God is faithful and that despite all of this, heaven is eternal. Jesus' death, burial, resurrection of the gospel is powerful to save us and his love, his everlasting love, is powerful. And despite all this, we can overcome all things that may be thrown our way, that God is faithful in the midst of these times. John would comfort the afflicted Christians in the latter half of the first century with these words in 1 John 5, verse 1 through 5. He says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Our faith in God can overcome all these worries. The trials that Satan throws our way, the fears of uncertainty, we can trust that God will get us through this and all other obstacles that may come our way. If God got Paul, got John, got Peter, the early church, through the brutality and persecution of the Roman Empire, what makes us think that he can't carry us victoriously through COVID-19 or the other things in our lives that have existed before and will exist after? We are more than conquerors, like Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 37, because of what Christ has offered us. I love you all. I wish we could all be together in worshiping, in physical, you know, as far as in the flesh. But we are in this together, spiritually. You got a whole family all around the world, Christians from everywhere, that are in this with us together. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. O righteous and gracious Heavenly Father, we glorify your magnificent and holy name. Lord, there is none like you. We thank you, O God, for all that you have done for us. Father, we are blessed abundantly. You are the Alpha, the Omega. You are the beginning and the end. You know all things. You, you created all things, and you know what the final outcome is going to be in all of these circumstances that are around us. And because of that, we know we can have absolute trust and assurance in you. Father, we know the end result of this world. We know what the end result is of Christians. It's just the beginning of something far greater. Lord, we thank you so much. We pray, Father, that as brothers and sisters in Christ, we can be encouraged. We pray, Father, for those that are lost, that they may take this time to come see you, to know who you are, that they may find solace and peace in your Son. Father, we pray that you be with our brothers and sisters all around the world that are worshiping. We pray that they may you and all things that we do, you may be glorified. Pray that all things be done according to your will. Let's pray in your son's holy and wonderful name. Amen. Before we go ahead and close, I just want to say a few things just real quick. Uh, one, we are going to overcome this. I want us to understand that we are, we are more than conquerors. We are going to overcome this. As Christians, there is nothing that can stand in the way of us reaching our heavenly goal. Another thing, remind people of these things. There are a lot of people, whether they be in our congregation, whether they be people that we know that are, that are struggling with this. They're, 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 they're doubting. They're wondering what is next. Comfort them with these words. Comfort them with the words of God. Another thing to be mindful of is, here's the thing, we're not here this morning, or rather, I, you know, it's Saturday night and I'm preaching this, but tomorrow we're not going to be here. And, um, and although that may be sad, that, 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 that is, it is, it breaks my heart, we're still doing this. We're still going to be worshiping God. We're still going to be praising his name. We're still going to be glorifying who he is. And we want to reach other people with this. Share this video. Send this, send this video to somebody you know that, that's struggling with all this. Help them understand that God is in absolute control and that there is nothing in which, if we choose to follow him, that is going to keep us away from him if we stay faithful. Another thing is watch this video again. Uh, encourage your family to uh, talk about the things that are talked about here. Uh, look, a lot of times when, we're, when we go to church, when, we go, when we're at the building, right, uh, we leave, we get in our cars, we're like, ah, that was a good sermon, or ah, that was a kind of all right sermon. And we go about our way and we, you know, we kind of... We forget. We get to lunch. We forget. Now most of us are home. And honestly, we're with our families. We're not really getting up, going anywhere. Spend some time after this. Talk about it. Fellowship with one another. See, man, how could we practice this in our lives? How can we implement this? How are we not implementing this? 
Take some time to do that and pray, 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 pray. Keep praying for one another. Pray for me. If there's anything I could do, again, if you're watching this, if there's anything I could do for you, you have my phone number, text me, call me, let me know. I'm, I'm praying for all of you. I'll try to reach out to as many of you as I can, uh, as many that are on the list. Um, and if there's anything that I can do other than prayer, please let me know. Love you guys. Love you all. You're my family. And as family, we're going to overcome all things. God bless you. And I pray that you all have a good rest of the day.